We're going to sing to him this morning, for he alone is worthy of our praise.
Father, we thank you for your name above every other name. God, the name that our knees will bow before and our tongues will confess that you indeed alone are God. Father, how we need you this morning. We thank you for the power in your name. God, I pray that you would do your work in us this morning and comfort those who are hurting today, God, and that the sweetness of your name would be poured out like oil. We thank you for your Holy Spirit at work, and we thank you for your name, and it's in that name, precious name. Thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Wesley, and today is our First Fruits Kingdom Give. Um, this is a, uh, something we believe in strongly, that the church should bring the first 10% and God will bless you. But as a church, we also believe that the first 10% that comes in, we should give back out to other Christian ministries and organizations that are working for the kingdom of God. And one of those incredible ministries. I have the honor of asking um, to come on up here, a representative, Teresa Vassar. If you'll go ahead and come on up here, she is a representative of Bethany Adoption Services. If y'all give her a round of applause. Hey, Teresa. Thank you for joining us. It's Naya. And, and who is it? Naya. Naya, my assistant. Naya, her assistant. Thank y'all for joining us. So why don't y'all tell us a little bit about what Bethany is? Well, Bethany Christian Services is an organization. We do a lot of different services, but um, a couple of them are 
We work with unaccompanied children who are coming across the borders that are in um, shelters, and we look for relatives in the United States if we can't find parents from where they came from. Um, and we look for those relatives. We do home studies, and then we do post-release services for the children that come um, across the border. Um, now you can tell them a little bit about where they are coming from. Yeah. So we help kids that come from all types of countries. We've helped kids from El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Belize, Honduras, <laughs> all, so many different countries. And, and so they come across for a lot of reasons. They come um, because there's a lot of violence in their countries. There's trafficking, um, child trafficking, and parents just want to send them here and try to get a better home for them. So we try to work um, with the Department of Refugee Resettlement to find these children homes in the United States. Mm. Um, we also do something called post-adoption services, which is um, we do services for people who have been adopted or people who have adopted children, adopted children who would like to find the birth parent or adoptive parents that need to find the birth mother for whatever reasons, for reunification or medical, to get medical information, those kind of things. Um, that service is not funded at all by anywhere, so we have to fundraise for everything to do that service. The other service we have is called a home builder services, and what that does is tries to keep children in the home versus being removed from the Department of Social Services into foster care. So we put therapists in home to work with them 30 days at a time to try and keep them in the home, or we try to work with them to get them back into the home. And in 2024, we're going to be starting treatment foster care services where we place children in the foster care system, work with them to try to get them back home to their parents. We're also starting our behavioral health services program, which is counseling for children with disabilities. That is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I looked into Bethany a little bit because I knew I was presenting you guys today, and what I found is they go to situations that we don't have to deal with or even think about, that when I started researching these kids that get sent over the border and then put into the worst circumstances, it turned my stomach. And to know that that's not, it's not only something I don't have to think about, it's something they go head first into to try to help, to try to minister and get kids out of these terrible situations and change their entire lives. So it is an incredible organization. Thank you all for what you do. Um, because everyone in here, our congregation, you guys are great stewards of God's word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, and you guys are stewards of what God has given you. We are able to give to you in our First Fruit Kingdom give $7,503.76. Of course. Thank you all for what you all do, um, genuinely. Let's give them one more round of applause as they go back. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm very excited and I'm a nervous excited for today's message. Uh, we are starting a new series on wounds, but I have, to, I have to give you some background as to what God has been doing, more than what we've already just seen. Uh, and that is specifically on how we've been preparing our messages. So at the beginning of the year, Pastor Steve brought himself and some staff to come together to plan out what we were going to talk about, what our sermons were going to be on. Man makes his plans, but God guides his steps. Yes? Well, both of those are good things. And then several months later, we came back together, got the whole, the whole rest of the year planned out. And whenever I, this series came up, Wounds, I remember having a good feeling about it. And everybody did. We were like, yes, we want to do this. Awesome. So we put it in the schedule. And I do believe God guided our steps because just a few months ago, God was like, hey, that plan you have, we're going to change it, and we're doing spiritual warfare. And as you all as remember, what turned into, hey, we're doing this for a week, two weeks, to a month, and I think it was about a month and a week. Um, and that happened in my personal life, and I don't know why I was surprised, but I started experiencing a lot of spiritual warfare in my family. And then I found out many of us in the congregation started experiencing spiritual warfare to a greater degree than we ever had. 
right at the same time that we started the series, Spiritual Warfare at Church. Again, I shouldn't be surprised about how God works, but he still blows me away sometimes. And that went into the series uh, that we just finished on the book of Habakkuk or Habakkuk, depending on how you want to say it. And that was, of course, about hearing God in the darkest times and whenever you see injustice and violence and being able to praise him even when you don't get the answer you want. And in, that, in the end of that series, we as a church were struck with tragedy. And I know, I mean, it's evident based on how God had us work the schedule that he wasn't caught off guard. But many of us in here are still reeling from that, from the loss of a sister of our congregation, a great woman. And then that goes into this series called Wounds Healing from Our Past. Again, I don't think it's an accident. And I was given the opportunity to be the first one to bring this series to us today. And I was excited because to me, I've, I've had the honor of growing up in church, the blessing of that. And so I've always known, you know, we get wounded from the world. Um, we'll get wounded from other people we trust and we love because they're people, even our best friends. And we can even get wound, wounded from the church. And my main plan today was to say the first point is we will get wounded but the important thing is how we respond. That was going to be my whole message. And I, I, I was excited because I knew what I was going to be talking about. And so I was praying about it when I started preparing, and God was like, yes, Wes, you know what you're talking about. But I want you to start with Christ's standpoint on getting wounded. I was like, that's great. You're going to start a message, start with Christ. It seemed obvious. And so I started researching and preparing and it took me to John chapters 15 and 16. That's where we're going to be today if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. John chapter 15 and 16. And Christ talks about getting wounded from the world, getting wounded from others in church. Like he, he addresses that. But where he starts was not where I expected. Because he doesn't start with any of the things I've listed. And it was actually very difficult for me And I think you'll see why when we get there. But I'd like to start with the definition of wound. And a wound is an injury that can be physical or emotional. So I'm going to be saying this word a lot today. And every time I say it, this is what I, this is what I mean. It's an experience that we do not like that hurts us either physically and or emotionally. That is what a wound is. So before we dive into the scripture today, I'd like us to pray together and just ask God to help all of us and myself today. So let's go to him. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity for your children to come together to worship you. Thank you for those like Bethany services that have been your hands and feet and continue to be your light in the darkest of places and the opportunity we have to support that. God, I pray that today you will give us the ears to hear and hearts to receive what you have to say today. And Lord, I beg that your Holy Spirit would speak to your children today powerfully. And we give all the glory and praise to you and in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And thank you all. So in John chapter 15, Christ talks about getting wounded. And who he mentions is going to wound us is not the person I ever would have thought is who he talked about. Now, I've heard these verses countless times, but it hit me differently this time. In John 15, 1 and 2, it says, this is Christ speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me, that is everyone who is a Christian, that does not bear fruit, God takes away. And every branch that is a Christian that bears fruit, someone who is influencing those around them for the kingdom of God, he trims so that he may bear more fruit. I was not expecting today to say we can get wounded, but the first place I mentioned we may get wounded from is our Heavenly Father. 
I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with the scripture that calls him our comforter, the Holy Spirit, our comforter. And Christ many times refers to himself as a shepherd who leads me and guides me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. But a shepherd is a shepherd of sheep, and we are called sheep, which, by the way, is one of the dumbest animals on the planet. So there you go. Yeah, you're welcome. And his rod, the shepherd's rod, is used to fend off animals, wolves that attack his sheep, but it's also used to hit the sheep to change their direction. Because sheep are dumb enough to walk right off a cliff, and to stop them from doing that, the shepherd has to hit them hard enough that it changes their direction. And the sheep doesn't like it, nor does it say thank you. But the shepherd loves them enough to let them hate him. And he loves us enough to instead of us walking off a cliff and going into isolation, go, being easy for Satan to devour and destroy, he is willing to discipline us even when it hurts, even when we hate it. He is willing to let us hate him for our own benefit. He loves us enough to trim us back the places that are bearing not as much fruit. He is willing to break those branches out of our lives so that where we are bearing fruit can bear abundantly more. God does wound us sometimes, but we know that when he wounds us, it is for our own good, not that it's going to feel good. When I was preparing today's message, it was in the front of my mind what we as a congregation have been going through recently. And the last thing I wanted to do was point out that our comforter is someone who wounds us. But when I was a kid, and you asked, if you were to ask me, who comforts you more than anyone else? I would have said my mom. It would have been easy. And had you asked me, okay, well, who spanks you? Who disciplines you? My mom. This is the same answer. In fact, you could have waited not even an hour after I got disciplined and asked me, who comforts you? And I still would have said, my mom. Now, I got a little bit older, and it ended up being my dad. I was stubborn. But it didn't change the fact that the person who disciplined me was also the person who comforted me. He trims us so that we may bear more fruit. And in verse 3 and 4, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you that is in reference of salvation. Abide in me and I will abide in you. The branch itself cannot produce fruit. We know that if you go up to an apple tree and you break a limb off and you hold it, it's not going to grow any more apples. That is simple for us to comprehend. Unless it abides on the vine... If you go up to a grapevine and you tear a cordon off with a branch of a grapevine and you just hold it, it's not going to produce any more grapes. That is easy to understand. You cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. If you hold that branch back up to the tree for one hour and then you leave for a week, it's not going to produce any more fruit. If you abide in God for one hour on a Sunday morning and that's it, that's not abiding. And no matter how much you want to see fruit in your life, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in Christ, unless you are in a relationship, a continuous time with Christ. If you take a branch and you hold it up there for one hour once a week, it will die. And like Christ just said, if you are a branch not producing fruit, God takes you off the tree entirely. But if you are producing fruit, he's going to trim you or prune you so you can produce an abundant more. I was not expecting to be talking about fruit so much when I thought I was going to be talking about wounds. But here we are. 
We're going to go ahead and skip down to verse 10. Now, we have a lot to cover, so we're not going to read every single verse together today, but I do recommend this week read verses chapters 15 and 16 in their entirety, and I believe it will bless you. So if we are to abide in Christ, how do we abide in Christ? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and have abided in his love, these things I have spoken to you. Christ, why are you telling us that God is going to wound us, even if it is for our own good? So that my joy, his joy, may be in you and your joy may be full. Many of us have sang the song, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We don't have access to that joy if we are not abiding in Christ. He tells us, look, there's going to be times where the good shepherd is going to swat you. Shepherds will actually break the legs of their lambs so they don't run off into a wolf den. There's going to be times where we get our legs broken. But our strength isn't in our legs. It isn't in our bodies. It's supposed to be in the joy of the Lord. And that's easier said than done. Verses 13 and 14, this, my, this is my commandment. We are to abide in Christ, and to do that, we keep his commandments. Well, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, just as you were putting me on the cross, and my, one of my last words was, forgive them, Father. You are to love others. No one has greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I, t if you do what I tell you. Recently, just a few weeks ago, Pastor Steve brought to our attention as a congregation what was happening at Ground Zero. They were being attacked for what I'm going to call injustice. They should not have been attacked, but they were. But Pastor Steve brought up a very good point, and he told us, do not get angry. Do not be offended because of an offense, because that's not our job. Our job is to love one another, is to love our enemies. And for me, that was difficult because I saw injustice happening to people who were not asking for it, were simply trying to provide a place to love on the lost. And they were being attacked for it. And I wanted to get angry and get mad, but Christ didn't tell me to do that. And for me, it was easier said than done to say, love your enemies, than to actively love those who were accusing. But talk about putting your money where your mouth is. This is before Christ goes to the cross. He's talking to his disciples. And he says, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend. And you're my friend if you love others. Now I'm going to go die on the cross for each and every one of you. Whether you accept the cross or you hate the cross. Whether you accept Christ's love or you accuse others of being hateful because you mention his name. He loves you. He loves them and he has loved me before I knew who he was. He loved me. And likewise, I am to love others that way. Now, this whole time we've been talking about a wound we can receive from God. And now we're going to jump down to verse 18 because now Christ starts talking about a wound we'd receive from the world. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but you are not of the world. Since I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, don't be surprised that the world hates you when you mention his name. We actually have a young girl um, in our kids' ministry program, fifth grader under. And the other week, I was up there getting to teach, 
and I'd asked for a prayer request, and she said, well, I have one. And I was hanging out with my friends, and she calls them her friends, but when I tell you what I'm about to, when I heard it, I would not have called them friends, but her heart is bigger than mine. She was hanging out with her friends, and she had asked them, what has Jesus done for you this week? Now, right then, my heart leaped. She's talking about Jesus outside these walls. Praise God, that's awesome. And her friends responded with, you're not allowed to mention his name, that's mean. Don't talk about him. Talk about an emotional ride. I went from this is amazing to back to that place of disbelief. This is a girl who just wanted to mention Jesus and she got accused of being mean. <laughs> and the emotion that I feel is these kids, but I'm called to love them. She still calls them her friends because, like I said, she's got a huge heart. These kids don't even know any better, but we are called to love them. I feel wounded from kids I've never met. <laughs> the world is going to hate us. Don't be surprised. So what do we do? We know we're going to be wounded. That's not great news. Is there something we can do about it? And there is. And in verse 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. He's talking to his disciples. But he tells them, the Holy Spirit's coming, and he's going to testify. And in Revelation chapter 12, 11, Revelation chapter 12 is a bizarre chapter. These are angels saying they overcame Satan by the blood of who? The Lamb, Jesus. And by the word of their what? Testimony. And they did not love their lives even in the face of death. And I praise God that Jesus didn't love his life so much. He loved me more than his own life that he went to death. He prayed, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But not my will, yours. We are to love others even as to death. I've not always been a great example of that. But that is the standard Christ is setting. My whole sermon today in a nutshell is you will be wounded. But we overcome those wounds through Christ and talking about what he has done in our lives. Because how do we overcome? The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. When the world hates us and perse persecutes us, we are to remember that they hated Christ first and he still died for them, and praise God he did, because if he hadn't died for them, then he wasn't dying for me either. And when I think of times where I have felt the rod of the shepherd, and it hurt, and I didn't like it, nor did I say thank you, after a few days, weeks, or months, I was able to look back and go, oh, I was about to walk off a cliff, and God saved me from it. So the next time that rod comes rearing around or my leg needs broken because I'm walking into isolation, it still hurts. It, I still don't like it, but I can testify about what God's done in my life. I can talk about Christ because through his blood, and what he's done for me, even when I'm hurting, whether from the world or from my comforter, I can look at what Christ has done for me 
And that is the only way I overcome. I will send to you from the Father the Spirit, and he will testify, and you also will testify. We are going to get wounded. And if you abide in Christ by following his commandments, there's going to be times where God is going to prune you back. You are going to be maybe in a season where you are influencing those around you, where you are seeing the fruit of the Spirit come to fruition in your life. And then you will enter a season where it feels like all that is being stripped back. I've had one of my closest friends go through that where he had felt like he was on fire for God. He, he gave the metaphor of he was this bonfire and now he's just these smoldering embers and he didn't know why. And he was just as passionate about God. And I know many of us have experienced going from we are seeing God every day move to this moment of what feels like a desert. That can be a good thing. Not that it's going to feel good, but that can be God pruning you back to put you on a launch pad so that you produce far and, abun far and above anything you ever have. That was the end of John chapter 15. We're going to go into John chapter 16. Why is Christ telling us this? So that these things to you so that you may be kept, so excuse me, so when these things happen to you so that you may be kept from stumbling, they will throw you out of the synagogues. Yes, there will be people in churches who hurt you. Yes, an hour is coming when whoever kills you, persecutes you, calls you terrible things, they will think they're doing it as an offering to God. They will do these things because they have never known me. I feel like I've been bringing up the parable of the ten virgins that Christ gave where the Christ figure goes away and five virgins are, are prepared and bring oil and the other five don't and they are left in darkness. And when Christ comes back, he only brings the prepared ones. Because there are many people who claim to be Christians in this world. And many of them are not. And when Christ comes back, he will only bring the prepared ones with him to heaven. There are people who call themselves pastors and Christians, yet they preach things that are opposite of Scripture, that are profane. But they call themselves Christians. And that, to me, is hurtful. But there's also people who are Christians, who love God, who have fruit producing in their life that may also hurt you. There's a, a man who was in our congregation. I consider him a friend. And for three weeks, he couldn't come to church Sunday morning because of a series of unfortunate circumstances. And I never once reached out to him. I can so easily busy myself with the work of the church that I completely overlook the ministry. It's an area I fail. I'm sorry. And this guy, when he came back, he was hurt. Not because, of my, not because I did an action to hurt him, but because of my inactivity. He was hurt by people he called his church family. And my prayer is that that circumstance can be worked together for God, for God's glory and for his good, even though my mistake caused him to hurt. The truth is, we're going to get hurt. There will be wounds from people meaning well and from people people meaning you harm, and even from our God. But how do we overcome those wounds? Through the blood 
of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Whether it is a wound from the world that hates us, it is a wound from the God who loves us, or from someone else whom we love, we overcome because we know what Christ has done for us because of his blood on the cross and by sharing the testimony that he has done for us personally. When I stepped out and I was in financial jeopardy and I was terrified that my family was gonna be destitute and I had to feel God's rod real firm and I did not like it, but now I can share that as a testimony to his goodness. Why are you telling us this? I have spoken these things to you so that when the, time, when the hour comes, you remember I told them to you. Don't be surprised. I did not tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. He's talking to his disciples. He's telling them, look, I haven't told you this before because you've been relying on my physical person. But I'm about to go away and it's a good thing. Though it's not gonna feel like a good thing. I love you enough to let you not love me. I'm about to go away and you're gonna be scared. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. And like we just read, we testify because the Holy Spirit testifies we have the opportunity because Christ went to the cross. In verse 12 and 13, I still have much to tell you, and I wanted to put the gif of the guy, you can't handle the truth. But you can't handle it just now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Because in the moment, it's going to be confusing and painful and not make sense. But when you trust Christ, the spirit of truth will guide you into why it happened. Amen, amen, or so let it be, so let it be, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will celebrate. You will be filled with sorrow, but your sorrow will turn to joy. We as a congregation, we have many, many members that are currently filled with joy in our suffering because of the loss of our sister, an incredible woman just a few weeks ago. But the Sunday after she passed, her husband came up onto this stage and worshiped God. And I can't imagine what that feels like or what he is going through. And I've been in times of sorrow where it felt like there would never be joy. I wouldn't have believed this verse had you told me. But in this life or the next, our sorrow will turn to joy. And 1 Peter actually tells us, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I witnessed someone who was sharing Christ's suffering still rejoice, and I don't think I'll ever be able to forget that. And I hope that in my time of suffering, I'm able to rejoice. Not that I'm gonna feel good, but so that I can rejoice and be glad when Christ's glory is revealed to me. You will be filled with sorrow, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Why are you telling us this? So that in me you may have shalom, which means peace. You're still going to feel the sorrow, but you're not going to only feel the sorrow. You will also have peace. In the world, you will have trouble, it's a guarantee. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And how do we overcome the world? Through the blood of the, and the word of their.
I have just a few more verses that are scattered throughout Scripture that I wanted to read today before we close as we're running down on time. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it as joy. Why? So that you may be complete and lacking nothing. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice with Christ's suffering so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because, this is, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It is a sign that when you are insulted, that his glory rests upon you. My good news today is you will be wounded. Not good news. But that we can overcome any wound. It's not always going to feel good. At least it hasn't in my life. But we overcome with the blood of the lamb and with telling others what Christ has done. This is where I'm going to end with these last three questions. Pastor Steve, Allison, and Austin have been doing an incredible job of trying to preach the same or similar messages through all ages so that when families come together or friends come together, you can ask your kids, your friends, your spouse, what did you learn in church today? And there can be great spiritual conversation. So the kids will be receiving similar questions. Why does God wound us? I talked about at the beginning of today, speaking truth in love. I don't like talking about the fact that God wounds us. But the truth is he does, and if I don't tell you that, then I'm not doing my job. But I also love you, and I want you to know there's a reason And when he prunes us back and he trims us, it's so, one, for our own good, but it's so we can produce more. It's so we can be a greater influence. Why is our response important? Because we are called to love just as Christ loved us. Our response is the demonstration of if we are abiding in Christ or not. We get to show the world what Christ did for us. And how do we overcome the wounds in our life? And I'm really hoping y'all can do the, y'all can give me the answer of this one. How do we overcome? By the blood of Jesus, by the word of our testimony. Thank y'all for being here this morning. It is a blessing and an honor to be able to bring God's word to his people. Brings me great joy even when it's a word that for me is difficult. My prayer as we close out is that we are able to rejoice with Christ's suffering. That we are able to show love to those who persecute us and our kids and that we come together to help each other overcome the wounds we have, whether that's from others in church, from the world, from our friends, our family, and even from God. Let's go to him in prayer, please. Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to come together. God, I pray that you will turn our hearts towards you, and as we are a light in a dark world, that you would help us burn bright no matter the wounds, the pains, the hurts, and situations that come our way. Thank you, God, for incredible ministries like the Bethany Christian services that go to the darkest areas of this world to bring your light. God, I pray that you would bless them, and thank you for letting us be a small part of that blessing. 
God, I pray that you would continue to speak to us, to grow our hearts, and to trim our lives where it needs to be trimmed for your glory. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise and honor that is to come. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. I pray that you all are blessed. You are dismissed. Go in peace.